Hello everyone, greetings from the shore of Lake Biwa and welcome to our presentation on humor competence in intercultural communication. Uh, my name is John Rusinski and later I will be magically joined by my colleague and co-researcher Caleb Pritchard. First of all, there could be some misunderstanding about what the term humor competence actually means, or some of you might think we just made up this term, but I assure you we did not. So let me jump right into our slides and start explaining our presentation. So first of all, about humor competency training, what is it? Why is it important for language teachers and language learners? And how can we implement it into our classes? Uh, we will then summarize two of our studies on two different forms of humor. And finally, I'll give some conclusions about our research studies. And please don't forget on Saturday, May 15th from 4 p.m., we will have a live Q&A and discussion session uh, on Zoom. So I do hope you can join us to discuss this topic much more deeply. So first of all, what is humor competency training? Well, we do not mean just using humor uh, for something fun in our classes, although that does have many benefits as well. What humor competency training means to us is, uh, first of all, helping learners better understand the humor of the target cultures and thus empowering learners to actively engage in L2 humor as that is no easy task. And finally, to implement research informed humor into our classes. Again, not just using humor randomly for fun, but looking at the best research informed methods for humor instruction. Let me give you uh, three quotes which help to explain the importance of humor competency. First, Shively in her studies on humor during study abroad talked about the anxiety that L2 speakers might face engaging in humor, despite the great importance of humor in this new environment. And similarly, uh, Lems also talked about how not understanding humor in the L2 can uh, make students feel isolated. And finally, since for many of us, humor is such an important part of our personality or communication style in the L1, it's only natural that we'd, we would want the tools to understand and even produce humor in the target language and target culture or cultures. But again, this is no easy task. Uh, there is a growing uh, body of research, uh, researchers looking at specific forms of humor and what we can do to help increase L2 learners' uh, knowledge of this form of humor, again, in the target cultures. But let's turn now to the Bible of uh, humor in language teaching. This is the book by Bell and Pomerantz, and they pose the very important question, which is, what is it you want your students to know and be able to do with humor? So just like any language point in the classroom, uh, we, they suggest using backward design to think about the results. So they suggest four stages. Uh, first, or results. First is just recognizing or detecting that humor is being used. And second, then understanding or comprehending the meaning of this humor. Third, then reacting or responding to the humor, uh, showing that you understand, maybe showing your appreciation or even sometimes lack of appreciation. And fourth, finally, actually producing humor in the uh, L2. And we would just like to add appreciation because just as, for example, movies or music can increase L2 motivation, we feel that uh, humor has the same potential. It's important to point out, uh, Bell and Pam Pomerantz are not suggesting that all forms of humor, all humor instruction needs all four stages. And we've highlighted number one and two uh, because that was the um, crux of our two studies. So we will especially focus on recognition and comprehension in today's talk. Now, we have come up with about six guidelines for humor competency training. So let me summarize them now. 
First, uh, we do need an objective related to the course and curriculum. So again, not just using humor randomly, but helping with other skills such as speaking, uh, reading, etc. cetera. Uh, two, also overviewing many possible functions, benefits, and consequences. So how is this humor used in the target cultures? Uh, what are the good points such as bonding? What are the negative consequences of not understanding how people use this humor? Uh, three, a lot of explicit instruction on micro skills. So what micro skills do you need to understand different forms of humor? If you're not too familiar with micro skills, we will give many practical examples in this video. Four, uh, multiple examples of the humor, both authentic and modified. And we will also give practical examples of both forms in this video. Five, uh, practice opportunities in a communicative fashion. So humor competency training does not involve the teacher just giving dry lectures about humor. So students um, should have the opportunity to collaborate and practice. And six, uh, also including reflection and feedback. So just like any language point, we need to let uh, students know their progress. Do they understand this type of humor more yet? Okay, so those are our six guidelines and we'll repeat these a lot in this video. So now I'd like to turn the um, presentation over to my colleague, Caleb Pritchard, and he will summarize our first study on sarcasm and verbal irony. So Caleb, please. Thanks, John. John is presenting outside, but unfortunately I'm stuck inside today. Let me share my screen. Uh, as he said, I'm going to talk about our training for detecting sarcasm in conversation. So John went over some of the guidelines of humor competency training, which we highlighted in our book. And the first one is it ha should have a clear objective related to student needs in the curriculum. We can't just teach sarcasm just because John and I are very sarcastic. So we need to teach it because it's actually fits the student's needs. It's very, very common in, in conversation in English. According to Gibbs, it could make up up to 8% of all English utterances. So if it's so common, it is something that we cannot ignore in our class because it's used a lot in the real world. And another factor, it's very harmful if it's misinterpreted. So let's, let's take these two scenarios. Um, let's say I'm talking to John and I'm being literal and I tell him, oh, you're such a great colleague. But if he thinks I'm being sarcastic, his feelings would be hurt. When really I'm just trying to compliment him, I want him to do more of what he's doing, he would be hurt and he might change his behavior. Um, or if I'm being sarcastic, oh, you're such a great colleague, and he thinks I'm sincere, he might keep on doing his bad behavior. Um, of course, I wouldn't say this to him because he is a nice colleague. Um, but I have had several cases where uh, my sarcasm has been misinterpreted with Japanese colleagues or friends or students. In one case, a student came up to me crying because I said something in a friendly, sarcastic way to her, trying to be, um, trying to lighten the mood and um, have an, a good classroom atmosphere, but she didn't get it and she thought I was being serious and she was totally devastated and was crying to me after class. So again, sarcasm is very common and it's very harmful if um, misinterpreted. So it's something that we do need to teach. And um, again, there's several factors of humor competency training and we're focusing on detecting because it's essential that they recognize if something is sarcastic or sincere. Um, also, we may um, want to teach students how to comprehend or respond to sarcasm. But that's not what we're going to talk about in today's lesson. Um, perhaps some students may benefit from learning how to be sarcastic, but in our case, we felt that's too risky and um, there's too many, it's too complicated teaching sarcasm. Um, there's many factors involved and there's too many risks. So again, today we're just focusing on detecting sarcasm in conversation. 
So the first part of their training is we should overview the potential functions, benefits, and consequences of humor. So for sarcasm, sarcasm, we'll tell, we mentioned to our students that it is very common in English. As I mentioned to you guys, it could make up up to 8% of all um, utterances in English. So we tell this to our students, it's very common. It's more common in English than in Japanese, according to research. And it has many uses. It could be used to criticize in a mean way. It could be criticized in a light in a lighter way. Um, research shows that being sarcastic um, often lessens the blow of the criticism. Not always, but in many cases it does. Or it could be just to be funny. And we are funny for many reasons, to amuse, to bond, or to flirt. So we overview these um, kind of uses of sarcasm at the, at the beginning of the unit. And then we discuss the use, the functions, the benefits, and the consequences of sarcasm. We show the students many videos and memes, and the students in groups would discuss, is it funny? Um, why would someone use or share this um, sarcasm? And what are the risks of being misinterpreted or being offended? So here is a Willy Wonka meme. So we, we showed these kind of memes to our students. And again, they discussed this and the purpose and their reaction to it. Okay, again, then we, are, we start focusing on the actual detecting sarcasm. And we include explicit instruction on the most relevant micro skills based on research. So the research shows that detecting sarcasm is actually very complicated. There are many factors involved. And the, the speaker usually um, gives markers or cues to show that the utterance is ironic. Okay, not always, but usually they do. Okay, so there are several factors. The first one is verbal context. The listener needs to compare their expectations with what the speaker actually said. It's often the opposite, but it, not always. It could be hyperbole, understatement, or it just could be odd. Okay, so we explain these again to our students, but in much more simple um, vocabulary. This is not a linguistics lesson. So of course we don't say hyperbole, we would give um, the word ex exaggerated, or we just give some example. And I will get to this later. Okay, also the prosody or the way of speaking is another cue. So again, with the learn language learners, we don't use the word prosody. We just say how we speak. Okay, so which of these might be sarcastic? Yeah, I totally expect us to win the game. Yeah, I totally expect us to win the game. Yeah. I totally expect us to win the game. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if I'm a good actor or not, but the first one was intended to be literal. The second and third are very, very different ways of indicating sarcasm. So the way we speak, the prosody, there are several different cues. It's not always the same. So that's why it's a little bit complicated to teach. There could be exaggerated tone, especially for dripping sarcasm. So dripping sarcasm is where we make our sarcasm very, very obvious. And then there could be a flat tone for more dry sarcasm. So um, not having very much intonation and speaking very in a, in a monotone way. Um, also the prosody could be just different from normal, like bad acting. It, it sounds different from how the speaker normally sounds. Okay, so again, there's not just one cue, but there's several different cues. Okay, for the facial expression, um, which of these might be sarcastic? So actually it depends, all of these could be sarcastic and it depends on what I'm saying in these instances and it depends on the context. However, there are several um, facial expressions that have been recognized by researchers um, there's the rolling wide open or squinted eyes. There's winking, there, there are raised and lowered eyebrows. There's an expression which is, which is the opposite of the words. So smiling with negative words. So A has the stereotypical rolling of the eyes and C has the flat face. So those are more typically sarcastic. But again, any of these could be sarcastic depending on what I'm saying. So for example, D, if I'm saying some positive words, this could be um, 
sarcastic. If I'm saying very angry words, then this is probably sincere. Okay, so again, we include the explicit instruction on the most relevant micro skills and we have numerous examples. So we try to have authentic examples, but we need to make sure it's very clear and obvious. So we usually start with some very obvious examples and then go to less, um, less obvious ones and more authentic ones. So we showed, modeled, and we showed and modeled the key visual cues, okay, the rolling eyes, um, the no expression or the blank face, uh, the facial expression that does not match. Okay. So in this case here, she says, I'm totally overcome with the emotion. So it does not match her face. It could be the exaggerated expression or the slow, the slow clap. Actually, our, our students liked imitating the slow clap. I, I think this is not um, something that's done in Japan. So again, before I went, I overviewed many cues, but these were the most obvious ones for the facial expression that we demonstrated to the students. Another reason these were the only ones that we chose were these are ones that were a little different from Japan, especially the rolling eyes. And again, the slow clap is not used so much in Japan. So we practice these more. Okay, so in addition to just showing these, we included extensive practice opportunities, and these were communicative activities done in pairs or groups. So again, they would. This is the example of the recognizing the visual cues. So we showed this on the overhead, and in groups, the students needed to um, guess which one is the sarcastic one. So A has the rolling of the eyes, so this is more likely to be sarcastic. If B is the answer here, she's um, pretending to be happy, but obviously you can tell she's actually very angry. Okay. Here's an example of the, the lesson that we focused on context cues. So we started very simply just looking at the image and with text, and then they compare the context and the words, and they can guess that here it does not match. Therefore, these words are probably sarcastic. Okay, here, he's such an idiot. Here you can guess that maybe the words and the expression matches. So probably they're very upset at one of the players and they're criticizing him. So here, this is an example of sincere uh, words, likely, because the context and the words match. So again, we show many, many examples like this and the students discuss if it's sincere or sarcastic. Okay, they also had practice detecting sarcasm by listening. There's a good resource at this link here. So you could hear people speak and some of them were sincere, some of them were sarcastic. So the person says, yes, I'm super excited right now. Okay, then they just, the students can guess this was sarcastic. Okay. We also had some speaking practice. And again, our goal was not to teach them to be sarcastic, but by teaching them to um, use the sarcasm, it was, um, we, we figured that this was a better way of getting them to recognize the cues. If they could demonstrate the cues, then they could recognize the cues. So again, we didn't actually want to teach them to be, to use sarcasm, but this was just a way of reinforcing their ability of, to detect the sarcasm. So we gave them several sentences like this. These are all um, sentences that people have often have strong views. People either love it or hate it. And first, by them, um, the, the, the student by themselves would look at these and think, okay, what is their true feeling about this? And then for number one, they walked around. And if they actually did love hip hop, they would tell their partner, oh, I just love hip hop. If they actually hated hip hop, they would say, ah, oh, I just love hip hop. And they, they went around with the students and they gave their real uh, opinion and they reacted to that. Okay, so was it successful? So we did a research study. Uh, I won't go over the details too much. It's in the chapter in our book, but um, we had a pre and post test. There was a control and experimental group and we had validated materials 
based on a resource by Rother, Mitch, and Pell. So um, a lot of the cues had clear context. You can read this real quick. So in the blue, Lisa says, I'm looking forward to karaoke. And she's talking on the phone. She hangs up the phone. Another friend walks in and she says, I hate karaoke. So you can guess here that this is not her true feeling because before she told her true feeling on the phone that she um, is looking forward to karaoke. So some of the, this is an example of a sarcastic one. And of course we also had um, the sincere ones. I'm looking forward to it already. And later she says, you know how much I love karaoke. So there were 50% sincere items. If some of them had no context cues, so it was really hard to guess if they liked, um, if they're being sarcastic or not based on the words alone. So here, based on the words alone, it's, it's, you can't, it's impossible to guess if Lisa likes karaoke. Okay. For 40% of them, we had audio visual along with the, the text we showed them. Okay, for 20%, we had audio only, so they could not watch the video. And this was so we can, um, we can see if they can hear the sarcasm. So we didn't play video for 20% of the items. For 20% of the items, we had no audio. We just played the video with no audio at all, and they just needed to look and to judge the facial expressions. Okay, so this is the results. The experimental group compared to the control group on all of the, the constructs. So we felt that our present our um, training was effective. However, the results were not um, significant for these con for any of the con constructs. However, overall on the, the overall data, the overall score, the experimental group did significantly improve more than the control group. So we felt that overall the research was um, successful. Our training was successful. So again, there are many rationale for teaching sarcasm to English language learners. It's very common. It's less common in Japan. It has many positive functions and there are consequences if it's misunderstood. And again, today we're focusing on detecting sarcasm, but you could also focus on comprehending, appreciating, responding to, maybe for some learners producing sarcasm. Okay, and today we're talking about conversation, but you could also um, research this in text, which is our next focus for our upcoming study. Okay, so John is now going to talk about another form of humor, satire. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Caleb, for uh, summarizing our research on sarcasm and verbal irony. And I will now turn to our study on detecting English satirical news. So as you may know, satirical news, uh, these are websites that make fun of real news, uh, sometimes simple daily things, but other times could be criticizing uh, political figures or making commentary on social issues. Um, most English speaking countries have a popular uh, English satirical news website, such as the Onion in the United States. Uh, as you probably know, we also have uh, on the bottom left, the Rising Wasabi, an English satirical news site here in Japan, uh, mostly uh, read by foreign residents of Japan. Uh, this would be one example of um, their work, uh, making fun of the difficulty uh, some of us have faced of navigating huge Shinjuku station in Tokyo. But looking at more of a uh, example of social commentary, um, this famous one, breaking news, husband cooks for wife, uh, satirizing gender roles here in Japan. So as you may know, uh, satirical news is often mistaken for real news. This is a recommended article um, by the Washington Post um, about how this has happened um, from country to country. Now, why would we want to help our learners better understand English satirical news? Uh, first, uh, Thinking of intercultural communication, um, the frequency of using satire varies a lot from culture to culture. 
and also the target of the humor. This type of humor is often misunderstood, which could lead to misunderstandings, and again, particularly uh, cross-culturally. And finally, uh, research has shown that reading satirical news, even in the L1, can help to develop critical reading and thinking skills. So these are all very important points. Uh, just to give more information about uh, number one and perhaps number two, um, it has been written that um, social satire is not so common in modern Japan. Um, so this could be a new form of humor for many of our learners. And if we just compare this, uh, The Onion, the most famous English satirical news site, over 6 million Facebook likes. Uh, there is a Japanese version of satirical news, the Kyoko Shinbun, but only about 15,000 likes, which is uh, much smaller than the rising wasabi with a much smaller target audience. Okay, so we were thinking, how can we help our learners uh, detect satirical, English satirical news? So we thought a good way might be to compare uh, satirical news, again, that's fake news, with what we call offbeat news, which is true news, real stories, um, but about surprising events. So these are kind of similar. So we thought this would be a good exercise just to, as the first step of detecting satirical news. Uh, let me give you one sample idea of this. Uh, let me give you two headlines and try to guess the satirical one. So Japan governors wear pregnancy vests to urge men to help at home. And number two, Osaka launches foreigner-only train cars to reduce inconveniences. So uh, some of you might know the satirical one. And here's what it was. This was a rising wasabi website. But the important thing to think here is uh, what was the target? And the target of this uh, satirical joke was this uh, 2016, I believe, uh, incident in which a Japanese train conductor apologized in Japanese for having too many foreigners on the train. So the rising wasabi was quick to uh, poke fun at this issue. Um, what was interesting, though, is some of the comments on their website uh, seemed, the readers seemed to not be familiar with this type of humor because they questioned whether it was true. And of course, satirical news is not true, but that's not the point. We know it's not true, or we should know it's not true, but we should also understand the target, uh, why, why they wrote it, what they're making fun of or satirizing. So let us get into our first experiment. Uh, we first wanted, we needed to prove, um, is it true that our Japanese learners uh, would struggle to detect satirical news uh, compared to, for example, uh, L1 speakers? In this case, we used 52 American university students. So we gave them 22 headlines and just the first sentences. Uh, this is because this mimics how we see satirical news often in social media. About half and half US media, but also Japanese English media for both satirical and real news. And they, the Japanese students could use their dictionaries um, as they took this uh, test. Uh, what they did was uh, completed a Likert scale. So one would be absolutely fake news, uh, satirical news, and six would be absolutely offbeat or real news. Just to show you how this would look in a Google form, again, um, they do not have to choose uh, one or six. They can choose anywhere in between. We thought it was important to show um, how confident they were in their answers. And we can uh, share this full sample test with you uh, or survey uh, if you like during the live Q&A. Um, I won't go through all these, but these would just be some examples. Again, some of these, uh, about half of these are fake uh, satirical news and about half or are, um, are offbeat news, just some examples. Okay, let's look at some of the um, results of the first study. And I think the main chart is on the left here. So uh, on detecting satirical news, a score of one would be perfect. So you can see the American students 
uh, scored almost a full point higher, even though uh, many of these stories were about Japan and none of these American students uh, had ever been to Japan. So they were perhaps not aware of current events. Um, so that was the main thing there. So we did establish that um, Japanese students did struggle to detect English satirical news, even with the help of a dictionary, and even if it was about Japan. Uh, these were a couple that were particularly difficult for our students. So the previous one I showed, breaking news, husband cooks for wife, um, they could not quite get um, maybe the joke here or the type of humor. And another one from the Onion, world scientists admit they just don't like mice. Maybe a bit too uh, kind of cruel uh, humor for some of our learners. So again, to summarize uh, study one, um, Japanese did have, our Japanese students did have difficulty de detecting satire, um, even with the items about Japan and even using a dictionary, um, and even though we controlled the vocabulary. So, what we wanted to find out next is would a, say, intervention of humor competency training um, improve our learner's ability to detect uh, English satirical news? So this time we had only Japanese participants. Uh, these were two reading English reading skills classes, um, about 35 students each, and they were divided into a control and experimental group. So as you can see, it was connected to the to the course goals. Um, this was reading and this was a reading skills course. Um, so just to review uh, number three on our guidelines for humor competency training, talked about explicit instruction on micro skills. So let me explain some of the micro skills necessary for under understanding satirical news. Uh, this is what some of the research uh, has come up with. So there's the rhetorical aspects. So just noticing that something would not be newsworthy, such as husband cooks for wife, okay? Or uh, there are also linguistic aspects. Satirical news uh, tends to be more informal, uh, sometimes using uh, profanity, etc., and uses more nouns, might use more capitalization, etc. And then we also wanted to think of the awareness of media and social issues. So having this awareness, of course, will help you recognize the English satirical news. Also, again, number five in our guidelines was extensive practice opportunities. So not just a teacher lecture. So let me just overview um, a quick example of some activities we did in class to uh, help learners interact with satirical news. So here's the steps. Um, we gave them a new survey or test and they did it alone again. But this time, step two, they could collaborate um, to enjoy speaking about the humor and, and thinking about what's true, what's fake. And the teacher could also offer hints, which I'll explain more later. This would be just one example. So this is an article from The Onion and this is satirical news. So they might do on their own first, just circle, is it true, is it fake? And then also going back to the possible importance of humor appreciation, if it's fake, you know, satirical news is supposed to be funny. So did you find it funny? And more importantly, how you detected it. So what clues did you have? Um, that it was satirical news, such as being not newsworthy or such as the conversational words. So again, a focus on these micro skills was very important. And this is uh, you know, quite fun for students to collaborate together and they could even make a contest out of it with other groups in the class. Okay, and going back to the uh, step three, teacher offer hints, okay? So um, you could give some cultural or language points to help students um, get an idea if it's true or fake. And you could, again, overview some of these micro skills or features such as um, satirical news also tends to be vague, talking about a local man rather than just, rather than giving the real name. So all kinds of, uh, uh, clues or hints that you could um, offer to the students. Okay, now importantly, let's look at this is the uh, post test results. So of the experimental and control group. 
So, and again, these are only the Japanese learners comparing the experimental and control group. So most important results again are on the left. So if you look at satire, um, the overall, both groups combined um, did not do so well on the uh, pretest, just 2.9 uh, of detecting the satirical items, when again, one would be the perfect score. But as you can see, the uh, red experimental group made a full point improvement uh, just from a about two hours of, uh, of training in class. Uh, and as you see on the right, uh, the middle chart about real news, um, what we found out is the learners did actually become a bit more skeptical about real news, which is also not necessarily a bad thing. That's part of uh, critical meeting, reading skills. So we were quite uh, happy with these results. So just to summarize um, study two, um, so it wasn't just the reading practice because the control, control group and experimental group had the same amount of class reading or homework, but we did find that the training, the intervention helped students detect satire. Okay, and just to look at both of these studies, um, including the one with the American students, um, so Japanese students um, did have trouble detecting satirical news. This is a new type of humor for many of our learners. And we did uh, fortunately find that the humor training on this type of humor can be useful. Uh, just a final thought. Um, some people might think of um, satire like sarcasm as a negative form of humor, but uh, we do not believe so. Again, the positive is to spark active thinking. And I did some follow-up interviews with students, and many of them did appreciate um, this exposure to satirical news, such as saying, you know, I want to be like my foreign friends who can spot the satirical news. And one student who had returned from study abroad uh, talked about, you know, she really appreciated the one about breaking news man cooks for wife because she wants to discuss gender issues more, but said her Japanese female classmates were not interested in such topics. They look at me like I'm from space. Okay, and also uh, as we've seen with research um, in Western countries, uh, one learner felt that you know, exposure to satirical news uh, could potentially spark an interest in politics or social issues. So very positive comments here. So just to summarize, um, with both the sarcasm and satirical studies, there were limitations, but we did find that the set, the humor competency training uh, did have positive benefits in both studies. Uh, we've reviewed these before, but um, these are our recommendations if you do do humor competency training. Um, so these are very important to consider. Again, it's not just random use of humor. And something new, but uh, we could discuss this more in the Q&A, but if you do want to also do research about humor, um, some points to consider, um, you know, pre-test the items for validity, uh, check with uh, target culture um, respondents would be highly recommended. Uh, and again, although we can modify later, we also want to include authentic items. And three, of course, you need a pre-test and a post-test to measure improvements. And four, uh, you need the control group to also measure improvements. And five, uh, be very careful to uh, check the difficult, difficulty level on the pre and post test that they're similar. And finally, six, um, we also highly recommend a qualitative component to see um, you know, what learners think about um, this form of humor. Okay, we have uh, published a lot on this topic. So if you would like to uh, read more deeply, um, these are some of our uh, publications. Just a final reminder, uh, we really hope you can join us. Um, so Saturday, May 15th uh, from 4 p.m. Uh, in Zoom room 11, humor competency goes to 11. Um, we, will, we hope to have a deeper talk with you. Okay. So thank you everyone for watching our video and um, we hope to see you uh, in the live Q&A session. Okay, thank you everyone.